Fasten your seatbelts. The foremost authority on 9-11. The best-selling author of Methodical Illusion. And a researcher extraordinaire. Rebecca Roth is about to step up to the microphone and launch into Reality Check, where the light will shine brightly upon the truth. Live from Hershey, Pennsylvania, it's the Rebecca Roth Show starring <laughs> Rebecca Roth. And I'm your host, Ramjet, and I also needed a candy bar. <laughs> I was just going to ask you, that sounds like a place where you find a lot of chocolate bars. Well... That's interesting. You never know where you're going to show up from. That's kind of fun. Well, I'm glad you could figure out a way to electronically transport yourself over for the Rebecca Roth Show. Um, let's see. First off, I promise I'm going to start, you know, we have to do things differently now because of so much censorship. So there are things you can't say, and really, actually, 9-11 is getting to be one of them. Um <clears throat> But uh, first off, I want to. We're going to talk about two different things today. We're going to talk about some 9/11 stuff. And we're going to also talk about um, the Southwest Airlines engine uh, failure and uh, what happened on board that flight uh, earlier this this last week, because so many people have emailed me, uh, just horrified, and you, rightly so, but horrified that that could happen. And so I want to talk about that uh, today. So those are the things we're going to talk about. If you don't want to hear anything about 9-11 or about that Southwest jet, uh, you can hang up now, I guess. I mean, okay, stop listening. Um, but I, I said that I would do that, and then I, I kind of babbled on for several minutes last week. Um, but what we're going to talk about, and I just can't put stuff out in the titles anymore because of all the censorship. Now, just so you know, and in the in the description box, you can see all this stuff. There are several ways that you can listen and to all of our shows. Now, since YouTube nuked our first uh, two and a half years of shows on Saturday shows, um, all of that stuff was put on in audio format. And I think every single show was put on over at Spreaker, S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R dot com slash Rebecca Roth. There's links in the description box. Uh, you can listen on SoundCloud. I don't believe all of our shows are on SoundCloud, but SoundCloud, it's going to be on Spotify and iTunes too. Um, and then also you can find, you know, over at the Rebecca Roth show.com. There's a player right there you can listen to. That's a Spreaker player. But if you go over and click on that, click over to Spreaker, you can find all the shows. You can go back to the very beginning and you can download those as MP3s. So if you've missed the original YouTube channel, and this one I just started up because at, at the time I had a computer that um, I had a uh, app on that would make uh, easily make the show go into an MP3, mp3 format and it doesn't do that anymore so I don't know why am I on YouTube I don't know uh, but I don't expect it to stay so that's why we have a Vimeo channel and we have a Spreaker channel for all the audio and these shows are just audio anyway I rarely do I put together a movie in partly because I'm working on book four and I had a, a physical setback with a herniated disc so I've got over that <laughs> I'm back at it and um, I'm back to normal. I'm feeling 25 again. And so, you know, things are coming. Now I put this book kind of uh, took a, a hit because so many people have found me because of, I don't know how, it's just a matter of time, I guess. The first book's been out for about three years. Word of mouth is getting out there. Coast to Coast AM's replaying the shows and uh, stuff like that. I don't know how it's working, but it is. And so um, people find out or they listen. I just, I'm, several times this week, I heard from people that were listening to Coast to Coast AM a replay. And I don't know if it's a current one, if it's just on their YouTube channel or what. I, I don't, I don't know. I didn't ask, but... Um, well, they just had information. And so as this has been happening, uh, I sometimes th some of this information is so vital that I just feel I need to put it into the next novel. Okay, so sorry, I'm late, um, but it's coming out soon. The websites under production, the artwork is done. And so matter it, it's really literally a matter of sometime maybe within the next 30 days or so that it should be available. And that's depending on other people, the formatter, the uh, editors, and other people that, 
you know, have a job to do too. And they're not just working for me exclusively. So <laughs> it's everybody's schedule how this all comes together. So, okay, let's get right to this. Um, and uh, Ramcha, did you have any questions about uh, anything while before I start off on uh, this whole Southwest Airlines thing? So is the title of the new book, Methodical Book 4? <laughs> That's something like that, yeah. Um, well, I'm very excited. I love the artwork. Uh, it, it's kind of a tongue-in-cheek, and those of you who uh, know and are in the membership <laughs> page behind the galley curtain, you'll get it. And I'll, you'll actually get it first. So um, what I'm going to do is uh, some kind of special thing for the members at behind the galley curtain uh, so that they can get a pre-order price, a super deal, and um, they get they'll get to preview the artwork and all that first. So, if you're not a member, you should be, uh, and it's a really great place to go. It's been really fun, and I get lots of uh, interesting people show up, and then oftentimes they'll email me and say, "Hey, over in the chat room, I go by such and such," uh, because the chat room is separate. Uh, but you know, there are different people from intelligence and different government agencies that are now retired and are all about the truth or airline people. And it's just very cool. Well, you know, that's another place you can go to listen to the show. You can go to behind the galley curtain and it's free. You don't even have to sign up for. Uh, that's true. There's a, I, I embedded them there. <laughs> so they're, they're embedded there. on the Saturday uh, Saturday's shows slash archives. And if they nuke us on all the other uh, formats and platforms, that they will always be on behind the galley curtain. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's what we're going to do. So I am prepared because I don't trust you, uh, YouTube to um, allow the truth to keep being talked about openly. And, uh, you, you know, let me just start this for uh, before I forget. One of the first things that triggered me into looking at this was one time I was, uh, you know, sometimes if I'm doing like cleaning the kitchen or cooking or doing something, um, I'll turn on a television. I rarely do it anymore, but this was years ago. This was, you know, a couple of years before, probably about five, six years ago. And I was listening, and I think it was a Sean Hannity show or something, you know, one of those kind of a talk things, a, a, opinion talk things. And there was a guy on, and they were talking about um, 9-11, and they were talking about the towers exploding and building seven and different things, right? And then the, then somebody mentioned that the, the uh, tag anti-Semite was used. And I thought, I, I mean, I was completely oblivious to this. I just, I, I knew this story was crazy from the get-go, but I didn't think much about, about it because I was still flying. And then after I stopped flying, I was so far removed from any of it and wasn't, wasn't flying for fun or uh, vacations because I'd already done that. And so I, w I just wasn't into the 9-11 stuff because I, I just wasn't there. It wasn't where my life was when I was retired. And um, when I heard that, I, I thought, well, how in the world can you get these three skyscrapers exploding like we saw or Building 7, literally, to me, felt like a demolition. You know, boom, building came straight down. Uh, and get anti-Semite out of that. I couldn't quite figure that out. And so I just kind of parked that in the back of my head. I said, this was the most unusual thing for somebody to be called an anti-Semite for questioning 9-11. I just thought, well, and it's, I guess in a sense it was a subliminal red flag for me that I, I did. I just thought, I'm going to park that information here in my head file so I did anyway that uh, it's always there now and I always find that kind of interesting after I discovered all the things that I have and that are continuing to come to the surface and people that are continuing to contact me with uh, you know either their oh my god moment I just got one the other day from someone that was basically OMG I just hadn't read all three of your books in a row over a week period of time and I think I need therapy after that last few chapters of, of methodical conclusion. Um, but it, there's more. And so that's what I have to say. If well, you there's think more. the last three chapters of methodical conclusion are going to need therapy, wait till you get to the, this fourth book and the last few chapters in that. You're going to need to have uh, a probably a 
shrink in the family that you can <laughs> visit on a regular basis, like every oh, couple uh, you of know, hours? I, I've already been thinking in my head of um, kind of a self-help book for us. <laughs> and, I, and I mean, I, I came by that um, seriously that because that happened to me. And I, th- I think that if you understand this, then you will know that um, in writing Methodical Illusion, I thought I'd figured out how they did it, who did it, what happened. But that wasn't even the tip of the iceberg. But I was saying, oh, shoot, they're going to kill me over this, right? Um, And so that manuscript sat for about two years on a shelf. And, uh, you know, I got inspired after talking to a New York firefighter about what he experienced on the pile afterwards and in finding the equipment, but with no bodies of the, um, you know, fellow firefighters. And so... Uh, I was just inspired and I just thought, that's it, I'm going to get this thing out. And, um, you know, at the time I didn't, I didn't trust any editors or, you know, anybody to go through. So it got self-edited as much as I could possibly handle it. And so there were some mistakes. I got professionally edited at, in the second edition. So it, it changed. If you got the, one of the first books, you got all my mistakes. And don't think that the 9-11 troopers didn't post every a constant complaint that they could find that I'd left a comma out or had a, a a spelling error or something. I mean, it got to be just absolutely ridiculous. Uh, but that was the truthers that don't have any data. So after that first book came out, um, that's when I got the Freedom of Information Act data. And that's when the people that really could read that stuff started showing up. And so what I say is my prayers were answered because indeed they they were. And so uh, without their help, I could never have figured out a lot of what came. Now uh, for the uh, third book too, but for the fourth book, it is people that were places and in jobs where they happened to be, uh, just ha- just so happened to be somewhere. And their story is so interesting. And, it's, and now that they understand, or maybe they've read all the first three books, uh, realize that they in fact were holding another piece of the puzzle so that's why I used puzzle pieces because to me after all the research I did for the first book um, and I had this crazy idea for a cover art (laughs) so I went to Ben and said geez God show me what I'm uh, what should the cover look like and that's how that uh, puzzle piece came to be so, uh, and it is the theme because it was a huge puzzle. And I'm, I've always been a person that likes patterns and puzzles and I've been able to uh, keep a lot of stuff in my head at one time. That's how I did organic chemistry. Let me just say that uh, <laughs> I'm really glad that your first in, in incarnation of the cover for Methodical Illusion never came to be because it really was crazy in <laughs> retrospect. To I know I told is. it to you. It was like, I, you know, because a lot of people love my co- that first cover. Uh, some a conspiracy nut woman who uh, doesn't really get a lot uh, but likes to pretend she's a professor. Um, she thinks I'm with the Illuminati because that's an Illuminati symbol to her, I guess. But really, to me, it, it was, was an a, Illuminati puzzle. Yeah, <laughs> it was illuminated. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna maybe dedicate my fourth book to her. Uh, for various reasons, actually. Okay, back to um, Southwest Airlines. Okay, here's the thing that people have been emailing me um, all week and Facebooking and all this. Uh, can this really happen? Uh, first off, just like 9-11, the internet conspiracy people that live on Twitter and Facebook, they have already spun this into a crazy conspiracy because the woman worked for a bank or because of this or that or the other thing. Um, and there's no way that Q, R, S, T, or U, or V, W, X, Y, or Z could have predicted this. So get that out of your head. This was a catastrophic engine failure and yes sit back relax and put your seatbelt on yes it does happen now I've seen this happen uh, before on other types of aircraft okay so sometimes uh, they aren't this catastrophic sometimes they uh, th- there's a cover over that engine 
and it's called the cowling. And sometimes the cowling will break loose. And you're going 500 miles an hour if that's if it breaks loose, if it's uh, the snap that snaps it together, the fixture that holds it together uh, happens to wear out or something, that cowling can come off. Also, when the engine blows up, it can blow the cowling off. And the cowling is not uh, like the uh, titanium parts inside that engine. I'm not positive that uh, the uh, fan blades are titanium they could be some they could be stainless steel or something or they could be titanium I know there's a lot of titanium parts in the engines I'm not an airplane mechanic but I can tell you this just so you know and it's important that you know this this is what every flight attendant does recurrent yearly recurrent training which you learn about in methodical illusion this is why we train and this is what we train for now it is pretty horrific to think that this woman when this fan blade an actual fan blade now if you look at a jet from the from face on i'm sure you've all seen this at an airport you can see all the fans right you know there's usually a little uh, squiggly thing in the center that little white line drawn like a little squiggle and you can see those fan blades in there. Well, according to what I've seen so far from the um, NTSB, the initial you know, look at, that they've actually said that one of the fan blades from the, the fan, that's a fan blade engine, uh, flew off as gone. And that's what they think flew. Now, if you look at pictures of this, the in front of this engine's around usually around 12 or 13 in these uh, this aircraft. This uh, lady was sitting aft of the uh, engine and aft of the wing you can see that in the pictures uh, that they took when the window's missing it shows there's lots of pictures online where the window's looking and you're looking out the trailing edge of the wing which is the back end as opposed to the front and so what happened is this thing's going around really fast because it's that's how the jet works right and then the airplane's moving forward about 500 miles an hour so when this thing breaks off it snaps and it just so happened to snap off and travel because the airplane was traveling 500 miles an hour and it was still doing whatever it was doing you know like a boomeranging kind of thing and went through her window and it hit her now, when it hit the window, it broke the uh, air pressure seal of the aircraft, and so it went into a catastrophic decompression. Now, there are several different kinds of decompressions that you can have on an airplane. You can have one that's a, it's basically a, like a slow leak. That's basically what it is. And the pilots get a warning of it. And um, I was actually on an aircraft that had this uh, happen, and it was a slow leak. And so we knew what we were going to do. But in because they didn't know when it was going to happen or if it was going to completely blow and we were going to lose pressurization, they immediately started into uh, an emergency um, descent. Now, the emergency descent where we can bring back 9-11 and we can talk about that because that's what this aircraft did. And, uh, as fast as they could, and this is, again, what the pilots and airline crew train for, Okay, that's why we hold the silly yellow cup in front of our faces and show you how to pull the cord and make sure the oxygen is flowing and uh, the, use that uh, yellow cup over your nose and mouth. And if you look at pictures of from that day, you're going to see a whole bunch of people that were only putting it over their mouth. But I think that was after they got below 10,000 feet. And so, uh, but if you if you don't do it right, you can pass out. Okay, so... That's kind of what happened. So what happened with this is when the fan blade hit the window, it broke all three layers of window. That's how fast it was moving. Because again, it's going around and around really fast. And then the airplane's going through the sky really fast, 500 miles an hour. So this thing had a great deal of movement behind it. It also, if you look at pictures of this, it, it blew off a large part of the cowling or the cover of the engine so you can actually go in and, and see a bunch of the parts there and, and the pictures that are available online and it is not and let me just repeat that it is not uncommon that this happens but what is uncommon is that a piece of that fan 
flies off and breaks a window. Now, Southwest Airlines had this same type of thing happen. And if you look at pictures of the engine last year, a year ago, they look, the engines look real similar. They blew up. Um, why it happened, I don't know. But it does happen. But it doesn't always happen like this. But it can. Now, since her window was broken, what do you think happened to her? Well, this is where you don't even want to think about it. And this is why the news didn't tell you, because it isn't a pretty picture. But you know what? I've had this reputation for talking the truth, and I'm going to be a straight shooter for you, because you need to understand this. And this is not a conspiracy, by the way. This was just the luck of the un unlucky person that was sitting at the window, because there's no way that Q... R S O T R U or V O W, anybody on the internet can claim that they knew this was going to happen to this woman or this plane. They just, it's just impossible because to the degree that this happened, it, it is, it is a fluke kind of thing. And it was, you know, there's just no way. Okay. So if this is really literally an airplane accident, and so the National Transportation Safety Board is there and they are looking and they're going to go through all of the mechanical stuff and all of the logbook and everything that's out there and try to figure out what happened and why did it happen. So they, again, this is how the FAA works and the NTSB so they can prevent it from happening again. So if it's a you know faulty uh, titanium or faulty steel or faulty aluminum or faulty whatever or a an o-ring and remember o-ring took the challenger down um, and they well, there's o-rings in these jets too that hold the oil in did an oil fall out did you know there's did lights come on all of that stuff's computerized and all that um, cockpit voice recorders and the uh, data recorders and the plane so that you, you know they'll study all of that stuff but what happened to this woman, just so you know, she was dead the minute the window broke. Wherever the fan blade hit her, now, the next time you're in an airplane, if you fly still, or you think about it, um, what part shows uh, in the window, if you're looking at the window, if you're at the airport terminal and you're looking at a plane pushing back and you see those people, you don't see their feet, do you, in that window? You see their head. And so when the window gets broken by this fan blade, or whatever part flew off the engine and broke her window, it hit her in the head or neck or both. And when that happened, and because the aircraft is pressurized, it sucked her head out that window because the window literally broke out through and it, it through the whole decompression process. The window went out and she, her head went out too. Now, I'm pretty sure she was probably bleeding because of the shrapnel, the metal, whatever part it was from the engine that hit her. And when that happened, the pilots now immediately go into a, an emergency descent. And so they're coming out of the sky six or 8,000 feet a minute. And they're, they're really coming out. And this is why you see a lot of videos of people that were on board that were doing videos saying goodbye to their family and stuff because they thought they were going to die. Because it's really scary to do that rapid of descent. And there's a couple reasons for that. And if you've heard me talk before, this is what didn't happen to anybody on the phone on any of the four airplanes that didn't really crash where that you were told on 9-11. Because what happens when you go down that fast, when you're descending that fast, the airplane shudders and you know, it's just a, like this really scary feeling you can't stand up so nobody could really help this woman at that time because you are coming out of the sky really fast and so the flight attendants are obviously strapped in somewhere uh, or holding on somewhere real tight and get grabbing some oxygen bottles and that's one reason why we have those walk around bottles located throughout the airplane and not just for first aid, but sometimes we need them in this type of event. But uh, you also, if somebody was in the bathroom, they, they got an oxygen mask fall down for them too. And they weren't going to go anywhere because you can't really walk down the aisle in this kind of uh, descent. So as soon as they leveled off around 10,000 feet, which is where you have to go down to. So they were at 30,000 feet. They probably came down from 30,000 feet down to 10,000 feet in, you know, six to eight minutes, somewhere in there, ten, maybe 10 at the most, but probably closer to eight, six to eight. 
it's pretty quick. And so uh, hopefully everybody, you know, was able to get an oxygen mask and pull it down because those things are on a pin. So if you don't pull it, snap it, the pin keeps the oxygen from flowing to your, uh, that yellow cup that you're supposed to put over your nose and mouth. So all the time when there's a de decompression like, like that, the problem for us as crew members is that a lot of people don't do it and they don't do it correctly, so they pass out. And so we take a walk around oxygen bottle and, you know, try to revive them that way. So what happened with this case is that they, they obviously pulled this woman's head back out uh, from the window and not much more than, than a woman's head. If she were very tiny, maybe she'd be up to her shoulders, but that only the window was open. So it wasn't like a hole in the fuselage. But isn't it true that if you have a rapid decompression like that or a catastrophic decompression, as you call it? that if it would have sucked the air right out of her lungs. Exactly. And so she died instantly. And that's not a pretty picture. And I know I hate to say that to you, but that is a truth. And uh, that is what happened to her. So they immediately tried to revive her once they got her head brought in. And initially, the airline didn't say it was her that was uh, sucked, partially sucked out the window, but it was her. And the conspiracy nuts on the internet are claiming that uh, it wasn't her, it was a woman that had a heart attack, blah, blah, blah. And no, it was this woman who was sucked out the window, her head anyway. And what happens when you're sitting uh, like that is that the first thing to go is your lungs. And so everything gets sucked that fast out of you. And so you're obviously no longer breathing. Uh, so quite frankly, if you think about this, um, for me, I look at it, she didn't even know what hit her. She was having a great flight. And maybe hopefully she was having a nice glass of wine or something or listening to some great music. Boom, and it happened and she was dead that fast. And they did try to revive her, but they don't re revive people unless they're dead. So um and it's, it's very sad. And no airline wants you to think about this. I, I saw that nobody wants the window seat anymore after this. It is uncommon, but it isn't unheard of. But And again, that's what we all train for. And they, everybody's making a big deal about this woman pilot. And granted, I, I think it's great that she was, a, uh, I think she was a naval aviator. She was one of the first women pilots uh, for Southwest. But this is what a pilot is trained to do, and the flight attendants are trained to do their part in the cabin. Well, you know, even on a 737 flying with one engine, these pilots train for that. They know how to do right. that. It's not that big a deal. They can easily fly. They can easily land a plane with one engine. I am actually have flown in uh, 737 simulators, and the pilot that was, you know, instructing that, he was doing all kinds of goofy things with one engine. On. And that's, yeah, yeah. they do it all day long every day, or at least in his case, he did. Yeah. And so, you know, for people to come out and say, well, this pilot was, a, you know, a, a national hero for what she did. And I think she came back and said, you know, I was just doing my job. Yeah, well, that's now, what we that's what I say. That's what we train for. And that's part of our training is when something goes wrong. Well, you know, Scully was was a national hero because they don't train for landing uh, ditching in the uh, Hudson River ever in recurrent training but they no, do no we do actually oh, do actually well <laughs> what do i know what know? do you know <laughs> yeah, what do i know but yeah. you know but they don't exactly get to do it right uh, exactly but with this they do get to fly on one engine and they do get to rapidly descend That's and they true. do get to you know land and 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 so that is what she was saying and she you know, bless her heart, she she did did her job and she did it well. She did, and you know that's there's nothing like having a really experienced pilot. And I, of course, always was um, grateful to have the people that had spent time in the military, uh, special especially naval aviators, um, that have been in situations where they really do have to think quickly. And if somebody's shooting at you, you got to think pretty quick. So now these guys uh, and or if you can gals, land on an aircraft carrier. Yeah, in the I was going to say <laughs> these guys and gals that take off and land with the air aircraft carrier uh, with the fighter jets and stuff. Um, that's the, what this stuff is is really made out of. So not all pilots are uh, made out of that stuff, but most of them, most of them are. But everybody does train for this. We do train for ditchings, but since they're um, they're not so easy to trained for because uh you know for the flight attendants for a matter of fact uh, we would train every other year or something for 
uh, the whole gamut where you would have a ditching. Well, we can't have an airplane in the water, right? So what we would do is have a huge swimming pool, and then we would uh, def uh, inflate the certain types of rafts or, or slide rafts. Some of the aircraft now have a slide that also has these uh, uh, inflatable tent stakes kind of um, sticking out uh, around them. So they also double as a raft. But some of the aircraft actually had rafts, big round rafts, and they were big. So like 747 rafts were big. But these are rafts that will hold like 60 people or so. So you can see they're big. You have to have a big swimming pool. What you would do is get to feel how heavy they were, how they would be connected to the airplane, and we'd have to mock that up because there wasn't obviously an airplane in the water. So when Scully did that, and that was really one of the first um, ever uh, ditch ditchings that we could really study and see what uh, what went wrong. Did anything go wrong? Did everything go right? Um, and see these uh, shoot these chutes or the raft chute rafts and uh, things that are that are attached to. Um, I believe that was an Airbus. So they're attached to the floor of the air the floor. Like when you would step into the door, they'd be attached there with a lanyard. So they, if, let's just say, for instance, they used those. Now, they remember, they were all standing kind of on the wing, the people that were, because he laid that thing down so smoothly. Well, that's the thing about him. I mean, the fact that he laid it down without causing the plane to, you know, yeah. cartwheel yeah. And, and not having practiced that. I mean, obviously, they yeah. don't practice that doing that. That's why he was, you know, yeah, uh, he did a fabulous as, job as a, as a hero. And you know, one of the air traffic controllers that showed up to uh, help me read through the uh, and FOIA data knew him personally, and so and he is a he is an incredible man by the book. And so we had a great conversation about him uh, around the time, I guess, of that the movie they did. And I still never did see that movie. They did about Scully, but um, I guess he always loved to see air traffic controllers can fly jump seat in the cockpit. Are they used to? I don't know if they can after 9-11, but I, I would think so. But because they're FAA employees, um, that they could get on and just pretty much hop a, hop a ride anytime there was a jump seat available for him. So that's how he got to know Scully and knew him. He knew he was a by-the-book kind of guy and, and really well-known for uh, for that. And, you know, you don't want to be with somebody that's uh, known for it's being a screw-up when your life's depending on it, right? So anyway, that's it. That's it. I just want you to know that there is no conspiracy here on this uh, flight. And if you see that flight 1380 isn't on the BTS, I think I saw conspiracy already about that. <coughs> the Bureau of Transportation Statistics is numbers or statistics kept on flight numbers. And if uh, flight 1380 from Southwest Airlines is still operating, I would be surprised because usually, and I've said this before, the reason that flight 11 and 77 were not added to the BTS wasn't because they did not operate. It was because there was no need to keep track of statistics on flight numbers that American Airlines knew were not going to continue to operate that quarter. And this was a quarterly statistics, and it was voluntary. They didn't need to. And just because it wasn't there doesn't mean the plane wasn't a daily scheduled flight because both of them were. But if you don't know how airlines work, then you can spin a conspiracy. And I've already seen conspiracies online about uh, Flight 1380 no longer operating, so it didn't op the operating that day. What really happened? My mama. And then just nonsense, crazy stuff. No, this real. It really happened. Uh, it was very traumatic. You can go in and yeah, find people that were posting their own videos where they thought they were saying goodbye to their families. They were scared out of their wits because of that emergency descent following that. And just another word, so in case this ever happens to you on board an airplane, when there's a catastrophic decompression like this, it sounds like someone set off a cannon, not a gun, a cannon in the, the cabin, and that immediately after that boom, I mean, simultaneously, the cabin fills with something that looks like smoke or fog, and it smells weird, and it happens, boom, that fast, just that fast. 
uh, it's like the window breaks. It's a big, huge boom. The cannon goes off, and then all of a sudden, their smoke-filled cabin and your mask fall down. And the plane starts mm-hmm. drive, diving immediately the, into a drive. Yeah, and immediately, the, immediately the airplane starts going down rapidly because they've got to get you down to that 10,000-foot level or below so that you can get some breathing. Because the oxygen masks are only good for about 15 minutes. So <clears throat> that's why this all happens. But that's what happens. And I know a lot of people were, you know, scared because they thought the plane was on fire because this thing, and it does initially, it doesn't stay. It just happens initially. And it's kind of like, a, uh, like a, uh, to me, it kind of it reminds you of that uh, fog that dry ice puts out when you put a liquid with it and it kind of is like that but it's it kind of di- it dissipates so as soon as you get back down to where you can breathe and everything's cool and you can level off around you know 10,000 feet or so um by then it's everything's clear so everything's cool but it is a very very loud uh sound very much like a cannon going off when the uh, decompression thing happens like that in this case the window broke open um you know, remember years ago, Hawaiian Airlines said, and it was a 737, I believe, too. Um, as a matter of fact, it was a 737 that switched out with Air Cal, that same aircraft. And remember, the whole uh, ceiling part of a big section of the ceiling part uh, of the fuselage broke off. Remember that? And there were some people sucked out totally into the ocean on that. It is very unusual to have that happen, but it, this is proof that it, it does happen. But it isn't a conspiracy, it just is an accident. And uh, everything, you see, this is one of the things I found in looking in 9-11, that there are people out there that nothing is real to them. Everything's fake and uh, crisis actors and didn't happen. It's a, uh, the cabal or the evil ones that are, you know, cooking up some story and I mean, it, it, it just is, but it is what it is, and this is what we train for. And that's why do I know how, how this works? Because I've trained for it. I've experienced it. And uh, like I said, in my 30 years, I've had two of these. Not this bad. But I've had uh, engines fall apart and the cowling blow off, and I've landed a 747 on two engines. I've landed a 757 on one, and it's only got two, and it's a much bigger airplane than the 737. You weren't flying, were you? I know. I I wasn't flying it. I was not the pilot, but I was on the plane that landed. So these aircraft by Boeing, I can can attest to this because it's happened to me. You can land an airplane with one jet. Easy. That's not a problem. No, No special skills for the pilot to do this. The special skills is getting the airplane brought down to the 10,000 foot level and hopefully nobody gets hurt. And a lot of people do get hurt when that happens because they're coming out of the bathroom or they were back talking to the flight attendants or the flight attendants themselves had heavy carts in the aisle. So depending upon where everybody was at that time, and if this doesn't convince you that then every single time you fly that you keep your seatbelt fastened around you, Nothing ever will convince you of that because this this boom like that fast, all of a sudden you're going down. And if you're standing in the aisle or you're not strapped in, um, it's not pretty. So you need to always remember this because that's why if you see flight attendants or pilots traveling on our own time or uh, you know going on vacation or commuting back and forth to work, we always keep our seatbelts on. And they fly with their football helmet. <laughs> well, sometimes you'd like to, I guess. But um, anyway, so that's it. But getting back now, just a few minutes, I just want to uh, talk just a few minutes about 9 11, just because when stuff happens, you know, I have a, everything has a 9 11 filter for me. So just to bring you back, remember on the phone calls <clears throat> on, <coughs> excuse me, all of the flights that nobody mentioned this kind of scary descent, which according to the uh, FOIA data and the NTSB and the FAA and stuff, these airplanes, the four airplanes were all coming out of the sky. Flight 11 was upside down uh, when they supposedly were in the aisle with the cart pushing through the cockpit door. That whole let's roll story is nothing but make believe. According to all of the data, 
and it all differs just a little bit. But according to all of that data, all of these airplanes were coming down in a similar descent as what you just saw Southwest do. And yet the people, if you'll remember, uh, the people that were on the receiving end of those calls, they never heard anybody screaming. They never, they've come back now and added some uh, of this kind of stuff because people like myself and others, uh, even the people that received the calls on those, on that day said, well, it was as if she was in the room next to me. I, I didn't hear any jet sound. I didn't hear any commotion. Nobody was screaming. You'll remember this, Amy Sweeney, uh, uh, quite a ways into her long conversation with her supervisor on flight 11. And this was well into a rapid descent. She said that none, none of the coach passengers had any idea they'd been hijacked. How does that work? I mean, wait a minute. Now, you can't have a rapid descent like this and have nobody know what the hell is going on. So when you start to look at all of this stuff and you can see things, and when I bring this out to your attention about how rapid this and how scary this descent was for those people, because it is scary, and that's why. And it's scary for all of us. Even though we trained for it, it's scary when this stuff happens because you don't know how successful the whole thing is going to turn out. You know how it's supposed to work. And that's the same thing with hijackings. We have these step-by-step -step protocols because we knew what worked. The FAA had taught us what worked over all of the years and all of the hijackings. They had psychologists on board that figured out what worked. All of the code words we should use and how and when we should use those and the technique for dealing with the hijacker. And it was those things on 9-11 that I saw were not followed by any of the crew members. Uh, and on contraire, they did things that they were never should have done. And the first thing is making phone calls to anybody, but certainly to your parents. And so it was in the crew members' odd behaviors and the fact that the pilots never pushed that toggle switch, uh, rolled through their squawk and, uh, frequency to let everybody know they were hijacked. And it's really easy to do. Well, you know, even if there were Arab hijackers in the cockpit, which there obviously weren't, but if there were, they wouldn't have known about squawking 7,500. That's probably that true. Would have been ha that could well, have Well, if happened. they didn't know how the microphones worked and they were supposedly <laughs> but, <I laughs> talking mean, that, to air traffic control instead of the passengers. But that could have happened. The pilot could have squawked that, and they wouldn't have known that that's what's, what was that's going true. on. That's true. That's very true. And so when you see things like that, and now for me, because I have had personal contact and I can tell you for a fact that now I know exactly why none of the crew members followed hijacking protocol because they were the hijackers. Not all of them. So, you know, if you're, the, you're, you're, you're a cousin or a parent, not all of them, but I know a lot of them who were. And so that is just mind blowing to me as a airline person. I'm sure it's mind-blowing to you as a passenger as well. But it is what it is, and that's why we don't have any photographs of any of the 19 accused. That's why 10 of them are still alive. That's why 9 of them are probably total, false, made-up, stolen identity. Do you know that the 19 Arab hijackers from 9-11 are actually used on a U.S. government um, poster? Yeah, their pictures are on a poster for what? identity fraud people stealing your identity uh-huh think about that for a while let that sink in for just a few minutes <laughs> okay the only picture we ever saw was Mohammed Atta they claimed which was very grainy and you couldn't tell and the other guy with him I think it was Al Omari both of those guys are still alive by the way but they were in Portland Maine and also on that uh, camera a security camera there's two dates and two times so, and they could have been a, just about anybody. I mean, they could have had a lick alike. Now, now that I know, and I've read through the John F. Kennedy files, hell, even uh, Lee Harvey Oswald had a look alike, not just a Mohammed Atta. So yeah, I see all these pieces of the pattern uh, all lining up. And to me, they use the same recipe over and over and over again. 
And so that's what I happen to be able to see is that there's, there's the pattern. There's the pattern. So yes, indeed, they had fake Mohammed Atta's. By the way, in case you missed this on other interviews, Mohammed Atta was a, an American Airlines million mile customer. Yeah, everybody knew who he was. So how does that work? <laughs> you got to ask yourself that because if you've ever if you've ever racked up enough mileage to become a million mile passenger, you're flying more than we do. <laughs> and we fly for a living. So uh, I mean, it's pretty amazing. But a lot of the flight attendants at American that were stuck in uh, Tokyo, and they were stuck with the United crews that were stuck over there because the skies closed down. Uh, when they told them that Mohammed Atta was the ring leader uh, of 9/11, I mean they just about passed out because they, a lot of them, a lot of the senior flight attendants knew who knew who Mohammed Atta was. So that's kind of like robbing your own bank, right? The bank you go into every week to deposit yeah, whatever, yeah, and, and that's yeah. the bank you decide. Why to would a guy? You got to ask yourself this: Why would a guy who intends to do what they claimed happened on 9/11? Rack up mileage. Why Why would you even get a frequent flyer card? Who was that guy? And was there more than one? Probably. Probably there were several of them flying around. Uh, it, it's pretty amazing um, when, you, when you put it all together. And then for me, what's just fascinating is the real true American heroes that have, you know, shared their story with me. And if it's a good one, I'll say, uh, do I have your permission uh, to build your story? Not you, and I'll change everything about you. Or even sometimes I break people up into three or four different characters with the information they have. Um, to it, put that in my next book because you know I don't want to tell somebody's story that's not cool with their story being told. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's amazing, and and a lot of people saw things, and a lot of people knew things, and and while we're on that. I recently got contacted by a woman who was a Verizon, I think, uh, Verizon was the company, uh, technician, uh, that told me, I can guarantee you, in September of 2001, things are very different now when you fly, because you can get wireless, and you can talk on your phone through the G4 and G5 services and stuff, because uh, it's a different system, but in 2001... Uh, we were still on analog, remember, analog phones. And remember when we switched from analog to digital and people were freaking out? What does it mean besides I have to get a new phone? Um, but, yeah, all of that. And she just said, I guarantee you that no calls could have been made uh, <clears throat> from the uh, airplanes, from cell phones, because the technology, when I already knew that. But just so you know, uh, she was a pretty a, – a, pretty top technologist person that had the understanding and felt uh, that she wanted to make sure that we all know that. Yeah, but she also made an interesting comment, and that was is that the, there weren't as many cell phone towers back in 2001 as there are today. And so there were lots of places that weren't covered well, places like Shanksville, Shanksville. for example, <laughs> that didn't really have cell phone coverage, or at least to the extent that maybe they have today. And so even if you could have gotten a cell phone signal through there, uh, they didn't have the ability to maintain that over a period of, uh, you know, a certain amount of yeah. distance. And so there's no way they could have been talking. Exactly. Now, here's another thing that the uh, government wants you to believe. They want you to believe that uh, 767s flew into the towers at over 500 miles an hour. And I've heard as high as 700 that airplane can't fly that fast at near sea level, 1,000 feet, 700 feet above sea level. That airplane can only fly around 530 miles an hour at 35,000 feet. Now, if you're into physics, you understand why that is. But if you're not, you have to understand this. Just take it from me. You cannot fly a 767 550 to 700 miles an hour, 1,000 feet off the surface. You can't. It'll fall apart. The airplane will literally shred itself if you fly. And this is where doing an emergency descent like this, there every airplane has its maximum uh, how fast you can come down out of the sky descending without doing airplane damage. I mean, there was already airplane damage here, but you don't want to lose your tail rudder or some other important, you know, your flaps or some other important part of the aircraft. 
aircraft are very fragile. And so there, everyone has, and there is a step-by-step thing to follow. And trust me, when this happens, these pilots go right into that emergency mode. They know, I mean, it's exact. Boom. They put their oxygen masks on. They uh, get that airplane going down now. And it has to go down now because you want to keep all your passengers alive, as many as possible. In this woman's case, and I'm sorry for her, but, uh, you know, if it's this is a hard thing for you, uh, she died instantly. And uh, and anyone would because it, the, literally the decompression like that, was suck all the air right out of her oxygen out of her lungs so she she had no more uh, she was gone quickly i'll just put it to you that way so you know th- the thing that i find interesting is that when people go through this uh on the aircraft and then they realize how scary it is if you look back then on 9 11 how do you explain that so many people that received phone calls were saying well it was like she was in the room next door to me i didn't hear any commotion and nobody was screaming. I didn't, you know, it was just so quiet and peaceful as if they were on a landline in an office in a hangar because that's where they were. And so, I mean, it, it's weird. And every once in a while, about every 3,500 emails or so I get, somebody uh, sends me or rips me one and calls me a big C word or something because you know why? Because they can't deal with the truth. And I'm really sorry if you can't deal with the truth, but I found it and I'm dealing with it. And it wasn't easy for me to believe that the crew members were who did this. I mean, that was the hardest thing for me to swallow. I thought it was one thing when I found Westover. And then I realized that the phone calls all started once the planes got on the ground at Westover. It didn't matter if they left Newark, if they left D.C. at Dulles, or if they left Boston. I was like, holy crap. That's how they made the phone calls. They were on the ground. And that's why Betty Ong saying they sprayed pepper spray mace in business class. It only stayed in business class because they weren't pressurized. This is what a pressurized airplane did. You just saw what it did. When they lose pressurization or you're in a pressurized airplane and somebody sprays pepper spray mace, it's going to go through the whole airplane. And these, that's, how do I know that? Because I worked for over 30 years in a pressurized cabin. And this is the stuff we train for. But when somebody says there's pepper spray or mason, it only stays in one cabin. That tells you that the airplane is no longer pressurized and it had to be on the ground. Yeah, that was a reality check for me. So I know it's a reality check for some people. And some people, even though they have no Freedom of Information Act data, all they have is an opinion and they just feel that they have to send me an email and call me a C or a D bag word. Well, too bad for you. So sad. I'm so sad for you. You can't deal with the truth. Stay there. Stay where you are. But what compels people to have to feel they have to send me an email? Because they don't have any Freedom of Information Act data, and they don't have any airline uh, background either. But they got a nasty word for a lady that writes novels. How about that, huh? Well, gee, I guess you know what they say. When you catch all the flack, you're right over the target. And on that, I'm going to say thanks for joining us this week. And remember that uh, the universe, Truth University, we're going to give you the first information on what we're going to chit chat about on the show right at the beginning. If you don't want to hear that, then just hang up then, I guess. Uh, but we appreciate it. And again, all of this information, you can find all of my information, all of the websites and stuff. They're all being rebuilt. So pretty soon they're going to all launch. Um, and you can contact me through any one of those and hit the contact button. And we'll be in touch and we'll be back next week, hopefully.